Hi! Welcome to the second part of our lecture on local linear approximation, differentials, and marginals. If you haven't seen the first part, please go to the video before this. In this video, we will talk about approximating delta y and marginals. So if you remember from the first video, the differential of x is just delta x. And if this is close to zero, then we know that the delta y or change in y can be approximated by the differential of y, whose formula is given by this, the derivative of f multiplied by dx. Since dy is easier to compute than the actual change in y, delta y, we use dy to approximate delta y when dx is small or close to zero. So this formula is what we will use for the next few examples, uh, which are all about approximating delta y in different uh, situations. For the first example, uh, let's say we have a ball 10 inches in diameter and it is to be covered by a rubber material which is 1 over 16 inches thick. Use differentials to estimate the volume of the rubber material that will be used. So for problems such as these, it's probably a good idea to make a diagram. So here's our diagram for this one. So note that we have already written down the given. So first, you have diameter uh, 10 inches. That means you have radius 5 inches uh, for the ball. And since we will cover this by a rubber material with this thickness, then that's the blue portion that we see on the diagram. So that's the rubber material that we will use to cover the ball. So how do we estimate the volume of the rubber material itself. Well, the rubber material can be computed as, so what do you see in the diagram? Here you will see a big sphere and a smaller sphere. The smaller sphere is the actual ball that we have, it's the orange, while the bigger sphere is the one uh, that encloses both the orange and the blue. So the rubber material is just the difference of the volumes of the larger sphere minus the volume of the smaller sphere. So since we are using volume of a sphere, then it's probably a good idea to write down the formula. What is the formula for the volume of a sphere with radius r? That is 4 thirds pi r cubed. So, uh, since we are going to use differentials, do you know how to compute the differentials? Uh, or, or the differential of v, rather? So, we know that what we need to do is simply get the derivative with respect to r, and then that's 4 pi r squared, and then multiply by dr. So now, let's go back to what we want to do. We want to estimate the volume of the rubber material. But the volume of the rubber material is just the change in uh, volumes. So this is the volume of the bigger sphere. So why is it the bigger sphere? Because the bigger sphere has a radius of 5 plus 1 over 16. So, while the other one, this is the volume of the smaller sphere. This is the volume of the actual ball. So this one, the bigger sphere, is the volume of the ball with the rubber material. Since this is a change in volume, we can write this as delta V. And delta V, as we know, can be approximated by the differential of V, having this formula. So, now, uh, using our given, where r equals 5 and dr is 1 over 16. So, by the way, why is dr 1 over 16? Because that is our uh, small increment of r. Okay? 
So that's the small number that we add to uh, 5 to get this uh, radius of the bigger sphere. Okay, so that's why that is our dr. Okay? So we will plug that in to our formula. Therefore, we will get this answer. So make sure that you write the units of measurement, which is inches cubed or cubic inches, because this is volume. Okay. okay. So let's go to our second example. It's a bit similar to the first one, but a bit different. So you have a metal rod that's 15 cm long and 8 cm in diameter. And you want to insulate that, except for the ends, with a material that is 0 0.001 cm thick. So again, we want to estimate the volume of the insulation or the material okay, uh, using differentials. So quite similar with the first example, but uh, this time, instead of a sphere, we have a metal rod. And what is the shape of a metal rod? It is similar to a cylinder. So Let's look at our drawing. So what do we need to note? First, this uh, problem said that you don't need to cover the ends. So that means, uh, what can we say about the, our differentials? Okay. So if we don't cover the ends, and that means we have no dh, right? That means that the height will remain as 15. So there is no insulation at the ends. will just mean that we don't need to add a small increment of h, okay? So we don't have dh. So in that case, your h or your height will be constant at 15 cm. However, for our radius, which is 4 cm, since uh, everything else will be covered, meaning the, the lateral sides okay, will be covered, then that means we have a change in R. Or that means uh, we have a slight or a small increment of R. And that small increment of R is our thickness of the insulation that is your point zero zero one so this point zero zero one therefore will be our dr okay so that's a small increment of r okay so again to uh, interpret the volume of the insulation that is just simply the volume of the bigger cylinder minus the volume of the smaller cylinder. In our drawing, the smaller cylinder is the orange one, okay? while the bigger cylinder, that is the cylinder that comprises of the blue and the orange. Okay? So because the bigger cylinder, that is the cylind uh, the metal rod together with the insulation while the smaller cylinder that is the metal rod without the insulation okay so now i guess we are ready to uh, write down our formula first write the formula for the volume of a cylinder volume of cylinder is simply or volume of the rod is simply by r squared h, okay? So we said before that h is constant. So we will write h equals 15. So we have 15 pi r squared. So this is important because we uh, don't have dh. Uh, so that means we only have r as the variable here, okay? So now when we compute for the differential of v, what will that be? Then 
we differentiate this one with respect to r, that will give us 30 pi r, and then multiplied by dr. So now, again, what is the volume of the insulation? That is just the difference in volumes of the bigger cylinder minus the smaller cylinder. Bigger cylinder has radius 4 plus the thickness, right, of the insulation. So it's 4 plus 0 0.001, while the smaller cylinder has um, radius uh, 4, okay? So since this is change in volume, then this is delta V, which can be approximated by dV, okay? And then using our R equals 4 and dr equals 0 0.001, then uh, we plug that in to our equation, 30 pi r dr, then we will get the answer. So, the volume of insulation is just 0.12 pi cubic centimeters. So make sure you write the units of measurement of the volume. So, let's go to another example. For this example, uh, we don't need to maybe uh, draw a diagram anymore. It's quite simple. So suppose that the side of a square is measured by, uh, with a ruler to be 8 inches with a measurement error of at most plus minus 1 over 64 of an inch. Estimate the error in the computed area of the square. Okay, so what are the given? First, uh, the side of the square is 8. The measurement error is at most plus minus 1 over 64. So what does plus minus mean? So it means that uh, the side okay, uh, has, uh, uh, is either uh, at most 8 plus 1 over 64, okay, at most, or 8 minus 1 over 64. So that's the range of the length of the side, okay? So what we want now is uh, to estimate the error in the computed area of the square. So we all know the area of a square. So that is area of a square with side x is just x squared. So uh, since we're going to use differentials, let's try to find dA. dA is just, so make sure to differentiate this with respect to your variable x. So that's 2x and then multiply by dx. So now, how do we uh, interpret this uh, thing? The error in the computed area of the square, that is simply what? That is exactly uh, okay. So how do you how do you okay? The error in the computed area of the square is just the absolute value of your uh, dA. So why is that? Because um, well. Uh, to understand that, maybe we can interpret first the measurement error plus minus 1 over 64. What does that mean? Okay, so measurement error of at most plus minus 1 over 64 means that the uh, side of the square is just measured to be 8 inches, but there's a slight error, which means there's a slight increment in your uh, measured uh, side, right? So the slight or the small increment of your side, x, is just the differential of x, okay? So since this is plus and minus, then that means that dx can either be positive or negative 1 over 64. 
So that's why we will put a an absolute value in your dx. So that uh, we have the absolute value of dx is 1 over 64. Or in other words, the absolute value of the error of the measured side is 1 over 64. So now, does it, does it uh, now make sense regarding uh, the error for the area? The error for the area will then be, similarly, dA, right? So it will be the differential of A. But since... Um, no, uh, yeah, actually, it's the... It's uh, delta A. Sorry, sorry. So it should be delta A. So it's the... It's a slight increment of A, right? It's a small increment of A. Or... Uh, that means it's the change in the area, okay? So, and uh, delta A will then be approximated by your differential of A. So, that's it, okay? So, to uh, estimate delta A, we use uh, dA. Where, so here, we still retain the absolute value because we have a plus minus error. Okay? So to reflect the plus minus in your uh, error of the computed area, then we also write absolute value. So writing absolute value here as well, then you will have 2x in absolute value times the absolute value also of dx. But what is your x? Your x is your 8. Okay. So then we will have 16 times 1 over 64. Therefore, you have 1 fourth. Okay. So the estimate, estimated er uh, error for the area is at most plus minus 1 fourth of uh, a square inch so if you're having a hard time thinking about this just think of the error uh, as yung sobra o yung butal no? so sobra siya if you have positive at butal siya if you have negative error okay so that means when you computed the area you since you have an error for the sides then you also have uh, an error for the computed area and that's the plus minus one fourth okay so let's go to the next example so this is, uh, look at a culture of bacteria whose population is given by this model so, P of T equals 6,000 times E raised to the T, where T denotes the time in hours after 8 a.m. Approximately how many new bacteria appeared in the one minute between 12 and 12.01 p.m. of the same day? So, first, how do we break this down? So, uh, how many new bacteria? What does that mean? That means... You're asking for the population, right? But this function here is uh, dependent on time t, where t is the time in hours after 8 a.m. Then that means this 12 p.m. will be how many hours after 8 a.m. if it's in the same day? Then it will be 4 hours, right? But for this one, this is 4 hours plus some fraction of an r right so can you see what's happening here the new bacteria that appeared between 12 and 1201 is just the population uh, at this time 1201 minus the population at 12 pm okay so it's a change in population therefore it's delta p and if it's delta P, then it can be approximated by the differential of P. 
Okay, so since here is your P already, you can just follow your, your formula, right? Okay, so let's write down the given. So if this is your P, then what is your differential of P? So let us simply differentiate this with respect to the variable P. So that will be, what's the derivative of this? It's 60,000 times e to the t itself, and then multiply by dt, okay? So now, uh, again, the growth over one minute is just, so how did we, how did we get this? <laughs> so, uh, so uh, what does uh, dt mean in, uh, in this case? Uh, remember, this is 4 r's, so t equals 4, but this one is t equals 4 plus some, a bit of time, right? So, uh, that small increment of time, that is your dt, okay? And uh, you have to write that down, so that's 1 minute, right? So, 4 r's plus 1 minute, but... Since t is in terms of r's, then you have to write 1 minute in terms of r's. So, that is just 1 over 60, okay? So, 1 minute is 1 over 60 r, okay? Alright, so, next, uh, the growth in the population will just be the population at the, this time, 12.01, minus the population at this time, 12 p.m. So that's your delta p, or change in p. So since we are computing uh, from uh, t equals 4, then uh, what do we get? Then delta p, using our formula, is approximately differential of p with this formula, so plug in your t equals 4 and your dt equals 1 over 60. Then we will get this one, 1000 e to the 4. That will be the population of the new bacteria that appeared between 12 and 12.01 p.m. And this is our summary for local linear approximation and differentials. So... Local linear approximation is tangent line, this one. It's a linear function, and it's used to approximate the graph of f when x is near x0. So in other words, this. To approximate f of x0 plus dx, we can use this alternate form. Next, differential of y is this one, dy. So again, uh, Delta y approximates, uh, or I mean, delta y is approximated by dy whenever, you know, uh, delta x is close to zero or dx is close to zero. And then to approximate delta y, then we can just use this one, okay? So where x naught here is your particular value. So now let's go to the concept of marginals. Uh, this is often found in business or in economics. And uh, we will use local linear approximation on this topic as well. So we first define the following functions. The cost function is the cost of producing X units of a product. Revenue function is so revenue in the sale of X units of a product. Profit function, so again, profit. And then price demand function is the price of a product if there are X demands, okay? So, next, uh, maybe we are interested in the difference between revenue and profit because they sound similar. So, always remember that uh, revenue... Yeah, maybe we can talk about that while here in the remarks. So, let's see. So, what's the difference between revenue and profit? P, R, and C are related by the following. Okay. So, profit is just revenue minus cost. Okay. So, that means when you say profit, this is already yung the net. 
okay? That this is your uh, gain or your loss when you have already sold and you have already sold the products and you have already uh, used your expenses in producing the products, okay? So, in other words, in Tagalog, that is revenue is kita, pero uh, profit, yun yung net, okay? Yun yung net nakita. Or in other words, revenue is gross, okay? Uh, while uh, profit is net, okay? Alright. So, yeah, or in other words, profit, yun yung tinubo mo, okay? Or yun yung nalugi mo, okay? Okay. So, revenue can be computed as uh, x multiplied by the price demand function. So, take note that the big P is for profit and the small p is for price demand function. So, don't forget that and don't um, confuse them with each other. So, these are some things we should remember. Cost is always never negative. Okay. It's greater than or equal to zero. Okay. So, and C uh, at zero units uh, of a product, C of zero is called the overhead or fixed cost. Okay. Kumbaga, yeah, um, you can think of it as yung initial mo na uh, puhunan. Next, R of X is also non-negative. And uh, R of 0 is 0. So, that is our assumption. At the start, we wala tayong revenue or wala tayong kita. And then, a profit may be positive, negative, or 0. So, if it's positive, that means uh, meron tayong tubo or kinita uh, na net profit, uh, net, no, na net na nakita Pag negative naman, then uh, nalugi tayo. And kapag zero, then bala tayong kita. So here's an example. A manufacturer determines that the profit derived from selling X units of a certain item is given by this function. So this is the profit function. So, uh, the question is, what is the profit earned in selling the 51st unit? So, what does this profit earned in selling the 51st unit mean? It's simply, uh, let's see. So, P of 50, if you get that, th this means that the manufacturer earns 525 pesos when 50 units are sold. And P of 51, the manufacturer earns this much when 51 units are sold. So what is the profit earned in selling the 51st unit? That is just the difference of P of 51 minus P of 50. So the profit earned in selling the 51st unit is the difference of these two things. Okay, So that is just 11.53 pesos. So what now is the marginals? What are the marginals, rather? So to define, if C, R, and P are the cost, revenue, and profit functions respectively, then the marginal cost, marginal revenue, and marginal profit functions are simply the derivatives of C, R, and P with respect to X, respectively. In other notation, you can use C prime, R prime, or P prime of X. So it's quite easy. So what does this mean? So uh, the marginal function value at a certain number n, okay, so here uh, when you say marginal function, that function can be C, cost, revenue, or profit. So we're talking about the marginal cost, the marginal revenue, or the marginal profit, okay, at uh, n. This is just the rate of change of your cost, revenue, or profit when your uh, production level X is N. Okay? 
So, this is an application of rates of change. Okay. Next, uh, F prime of N or the marginal cost, marginal revenue or marginal profit at N is an approximation of this one. F of N plus 1 minus F of N. Or in other words, from our previous example, this is just the cost, uh, uh, the cost, the revenue, or profit earned when selling the n plus one unit, right? Because a while ago that was fifty first unit, right? So the profit earned in selling the fifty first unit is p of fifty one minus p of fifty. Okay, so if this is n plus one and this is n, then this is uh, profit earned in selling n plus one unit. Okay, so that's what we are talking about here. Okay, so this one. So why is that so? Why is this an approximation of this uh, expression? This is using a local linear approximation of F of cost, revenue, or profit at x equals n. So in that case, our dx will be 1. And we will have this one. So this is delta f. And this is uh, approximated by uh, df. Okay? Uh, or differential of f, which is just f prime of n times dx. Okay? But dx is 1. Therefore, we have f prime of n. Okay? So this is marginal profit at a uh, production level of n. This is the cost, revenue, or profit earned in selling the n plus 1th unit. Okay. So, let's go back to this example. But instead of... Uh, so now, the, the only difference is this one. We want to use marginals to approximate the profit earned in selling the 51st unit. So, what do we know? Again, the profit earned in selling the 51st unit is... The difference of P of 51 minus P of 50. Marginal profit, meanwhile, is P prime of 50. And we know that this expression is approximated by P prime of 50. So, let's just compute P prime of 50 first. Compute the marginal profit function. So, it's just the derivative with respect to X. So, very easy. And then, let us substitute 50 here. So, you will get 11.50 pesos. So, this is now the estimate of the profit earned in selling the 51st unit. So, estimated. So, what is the actual? The actual was, from the previous slide, 11.53 pesos. So, not bad. So, it's quite close. Now, other applications... Uh, so, to answer the following questions, let's use the applications of derivatives to answer them, okay? So, first question, if the marginal profit P prime of N is positive for a certain production level X equals N, then profit is increasing or decreasing at the production level X equals N? So, what do you think is the answer? So remember that if P prime or the derivative is positive, is the function increasing or decreasing? It is increasing. So the answer is increasing. Okay, next, if P prime of N is 0 and P double prime of N is negative at a certain production level X equals N, then... Is the profit locally maximized or locally minimized when selling N units? What do you mean again by locally maximized or locally minimized? That is exactly the relative max or relative min. So what do you have if you have P prime of N is 0 and P double prime of N is negative? So by second derivative test, this tells us that we have a relative max. Right? So that means you have 
locally maximized. And here are some exercises that you can try by yourself. Uh, hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you again in a future lecture of Math 21. Stay safe and stay healthy. Bye!